Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Carver. I'm a product specialist here at Oculus. Welcome to tonight's clinical webcast, Ablating the Mystery, how to use the Pentacam and other technology to manage your refractive surgery patients. You have a text box on your GoToWebinar screen where you can enter in questions. Enter your questions as early as you can, and we'll discuss them during tonight's webcast. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Biren McPara. Dr. McPara is the co-director of refractive surgery and a member of the cornea service at Wills Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's a fellowship trained ophthalmologist who specializes in cornea, cataract, and laser refractive surgery as the co-director of refractive surgery. Dr. McPara is an expert in LASIK, advanced surface ablation, PRK, and phagic interocular lens surgery. While practicing at a large referral center, he has developed a special interest in diagnosing and managing the rare complications after refractive surgery. Dr. McPara graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine, where he was selected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. He completed his ophthalmology res residency at Cullen Eye Institute, Baylor College of Medicine. After residency, Dr. Meg Parra completed a fellowship in corneal and refractive surgery at the University of Colorado. He has a faculty appointment at Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University and is a team ophthalmologist for the Philadelphia Phillies baseball team. He has authored numerous articles and delivered lectures at local, national, and international meetings. He is actively involved in teaching ophthalmology residents on the cornea service at Wills Eye Hospital and was awarded the prestigious Golden Apple Resident Teaching Award in 2019. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, Dr. McPara. Thank you very much, Carver, for that great introduction um, and the opportunity to give tonight's talk. Uh, a warm welcome to everyone out there for joining us. We really do appreciate you taking the time out to join us. Um, as uh, was mentioned, the name of the talk is Ablating the Mystery, How to Use Pentacam and Other Technology to Manage Refractive Surgery Patients. These are my financial disclosures. And as Carver mentioned, um, please don't wait until the end of the talk to ask any questions that you have. We will take a short break in the middle and, and hopefully we'll have some questions that, that I'll be able to answer for you. What we hope to accomplish in tonight's talk is to show how I use various pieces of diagnostic equipment to screen for ectasia during my refractive surgery evaluations. I'll then discuss how I further try to mitigate risk by deciding whether LASIK or PRK is the more ideal option. And finally, um, we all know that refractive surgery is a very safe surgery, but like in any surgery, there is always a risk of complication. So we'll go over two potential complications and how I identify and how I manage them. Starting out with diagnostic testing for ectasia risk. Now, Wills, we're fortunate to have um, a nice variety of diagnostic equipment. And I do like to have as much information as possible. There's something to be said about information paralysis, but when it comes to screening for ectasia, at least in my opinion, the more is better. So what I utilize, um, and I'm sure many of you utilize the exact same things, are placido-based topography, Oculus's Pentacam, as well as OCT-based epithelial mapping. So the first uh, test we'll talk about is topography. Um, and this is something we've all been very familiar with um, for a long time. It's based on placido ring-based uh, technology. And what it does is we're measuring the geometric shape um, of the cornea and measuring the slope of the cornea. The basic principle is that a placido disc image is projected onto the anterior surface of the cornea. And some of this light is reflected back to the device. And the device then calculates the distance between the rings. And the shorter the distance, the steeper the cornea. The further apart the distance, the flatter the cornea. And this um, is then put through the computer and an image um, is generated that we all are very familiar with and we can interpret. Now, one thing um, to emphasize, uh, and it's very important, is this device just measures the anterior surface of the cornea. In addition to that, it also takes into account the tear film, which can be both a good and a bad thing. For example, sometimes if we have an irregular tear film, we can get images that show that the cornea is irregular when in fact it really isn't. On the other hand, I do see this as a positive. 
during my refractive surgery screenings, I am screening for dry eye. And if we see irregular placido discs, that is a good indication that you know, the ocular surface may be a little dry and I may have to pay attention to this a little bit more during my exam. So that's the first piece of equipment. The second piece of equipment is Oculus's Pentacam. And what this does is it utilizes a rotating shine blue camera and it measures the anterior surface of the cornea. But as I'm sure all of you know, it also has the ability to measure the posterior surface of the cornea. This is a map that I find very useful. It's the four maps refractive map and it gives you um, a, a nice amount of raw data on the left. But when looking at the maps, um, we have four very useful images here. The top left is the axial map, which is very similar and familiar um, if you're a Placido topographer user. The one below that, so the bottom left, is a corneal thickness map. And we have the ability to generate that because we can measure both the anterior and the posterior surface of the cornea. And the two maps on the right are elevation maps. Um, and this is something that I find very useful that the Pentacam can provide us. Now, in order to um, measure elevation, what we're really doing is we're measuring uh, the geometric height of the cornea. And in order to do that, we have to use what's called a reference surface. And, and what we often use is what's called the best fit sphere. So on the slide there, we have my schematic cornea. And it looks like there's a little bit of steepening or protrusion there. When we apply a best fit sphere to that and create an elevation map, anything above that best fit sphere would show up as a positive elevation or a plus number on the right side. Also, these maps are color coded. So anything that is elevated above that best fit sphere um, has more of a, a warmer tone to it. And anything below that sphere um, would be considered um, or will be depicted as, as a cooler tone and as a negative number. So again, measuring elevation, you have to utilize what's called the best fit sphere. And we'll get more into that in just a second. Um, now the Pentacam takes the idea of elevation a little bit further and provides us with the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced dictation display. Now there are Plenty of talks on this that are available on demand from Oculus by the creators of this display, world experts in the field. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, um, but what I do want to just touch on is the left side of this. And, and that is what, what I like to call the enhanced elevation display. And what this uses is an enhanced reference surface. So here again, we have our best fit sphere with our cornea that has a, a mild amount or a subtle amount of protrusion. What the enhanced elevation display does is it will ignore, when creating the best fit sphere, it will ignore the three to four millimeters of thinnest cornea. And it will ignore that when computing the best fit sphere and reference it to what would be considered more of a normal cornea. So again, you ignore the three to four thinnest millimeters of the cornea and create your best fit sphere um, with that in mind. And what that does is it will emphasize any er areas of, of elevation and make that easier to pick up during your screening exams. And if you look at the two images side by side, this is the same patient. The one on the left is the regular elevation map using the regular um, best fit sphere. And on the right, you have the enhanced elevation map. And you can see that you can more readily pick up on areas of elevation. And then finally, the final tool that I use um, is OCT-based epithelial mapping. This is the most recent addition to my preoperative testing, and I found it quite useful. So in normal eyes, um, the corneal epithelium is remarkably very uniform across the surface of the cornea. If you look at the image on the right and look at the central cornea, the epithelial thickness is within you know, two or three microns, um, so very, very uniform. And when you have corneas with pathology, the epithelium has the ability to remodel to mask um, what can be potential underlying stromal irregularities. And we take this concept and, and we use it to our advantage. So for example, when we have a patient with keratoconus, um, what we see on the left is the pachymetry map on the OCT, which is a map of thickness of the entire cornea. On the right, we have the epithelial map. And what happens is we see thinning of the corneal epithelium at the apex of the cone. Uh, and we don't have a topography here, but just imagine the apex of the cone is on the thinnest point. 
So if you look on the right image, you can see the cooler hues, the cooler tones, indicating that the corneal epithelium is thinner there. And then what you also have is this compensatory hyperplasia surrounding it. So you almost get what's known as the donut pattern. So you have a thin spot of epithelium at the apex of the cornea and surrounding it, you get this donut of epithelial hyperplasia. And this is a pretty reproducible pattern that we see in our keratoconic patients. So this is that exact same patient and we have the patient's topography on the left where we see inferior steepening that is consistent with keratoconus. And we have the pentacam four map refractive display that shows inferior paracentral thinning as well as anterior and posterior elevation of the cornea. So you know, in, in all honesty, in, in this situation, you don't really need epithelial mapping to make the diagnosis. This is pretty obvious keratoconus. But if you overlay the epithelial map on top of the topography, you can see again that that area of epithelial thinning lays right on top of the apex of the cone. And, and this, this is reproducible. We see this all the time in keratoconus patients. Now, when it comes to screening in refractive surgery patients, obviously we're not going to be doing any sort of surgery on keratoconus patients, but we're looking for those subclinical cases, those cases that may not be readily apparent. And in these cases, we will still see subtle thinning in the area of potential um, corneal protrusion. So on the right image, we see the epithelial map. And if you look just down and left to the center, you do see that that corneal epithelium is a few microns thinner than the rest of the cornea. And, and you know, it's just you know five or six microns thinner, but that subtle difference um, should set off a red flag in that this patient may have subclinical keratoconus and may not be the best candidate for laser vision correction. Now, the epithelial mapping, it, it not only helps us find subclinical cases of keratoconus weeding out the poor candidates, but it can also help us find false positives. And what I mean by that is patients may have a topography or a pentacam that just looks a little funny, especially the anterior surface of the cornea. Um, but by utilizing the epithelial map, we may be able to kind of decide that that may not be that abnormal. And one such example is contact lens related warpage. And, and a lot of times we see patients that have inferior steepening on topography in a known contact lens user. And if we look at the epithelial map, um, we see that in the area of steepening or protrusion, instead of being thin, the epithelium is actually thick. And that is a sign of kind of contact lens warpage. So here we have a patient where the topography does have a little bit of asymmetric steepening. The inferior cornea does look a little bit steeper than the superior cornea. And if this were subclinical keratoconus, what we'd expect to see is a blue spot over that inferior steepening. But here we saw um, the, the yellow spot indicating that the, the epithelium is thicker, and this probably is a case of contact lens warpage. So to better uh, explain and illustrate some of these concepts, I have a couple cases here. So this uh, patient, and these are all real patients that I've seen in my practice. So this is a 22-year-old male who presented for a refractive surgery evaluation who has a moderate amount of, of spherical myopia with not much astigmatism. These are his placido-based topography axial maps. And for the most part, this looks like pretty regular with the rule astigmatism. The right eye may have a little bit of irregularity, but that could just be ocular surface. Um, but the left eye looks like your classic, you know, vertical bow tie with the rule astigmatism. With all screenings, the patients also get a pentacam, and this is the four map refractive map. And again, if you look at the axial map, that looks pretty normal. Corneal thickness, again, fairly normal. And if we look at the anterior elevation in the top right, both eyes look fairly normal. But the, the key point of the pentacam is it can measure the posterior cornea. And if we look closely at the elevation map of the back of the cornea, we can see these warm spots or hot spots. And these indicate areas of posterior elevation, which are suggestive of subclinical keratoconus. And those are indicated by the arrows right there. Taking that one step further, if we use the, the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display, and we use the enhanced reference sphere, again, eliminating the three to four millimeters of the thinnest point of the cornea, we see that 
those hot spots are further emphasized. Um, and again, this is making me worry that this patient may have subclinical keratoconus. And instead of offering him, you know, LASIK or PRK, I actually had him follow up in the office a few months later to make sure or, or to follow him to see if he does go on to develop keratoconus and potentially become a cross-linking patient. So this is a prime example where you can't just rely on the anterior cornea during your refractive evaluations, that looking at the posterior cornea is very, very important. Now here's a case um, that's a little bit different. So this is a 34-year-old female um, who presented again for a refractive surgery evaluation. The right eye, a moderate amount of spherical myopia. The left eye does have um, a mild to, to moderate amount of astigmatism. And when we look, when we look at the topographies, there is a little bit of irregularity here, a little bit of asymmetry in the steepening, a little bit of inferior steepening that, that is more pronounced than the superior cornea. The next step is getting a pentacam, and this is the left eye. Um, going back, the left eye looked a little bit more suspicious. That was the one that I was more worried about, so we'll focus on the left eye in this case. Again, if you look at the axial map, you can imagine that, yeah, that patient does have some inferior steepening. However, the corneal thickness um, is good. The thin point may be displaced a little bit, but that, that looks pretty good to me. The anterior surface of the cornea, the elevation map of the front of the cornea, looks pretty normal. And, and maybe more importantly, the back of the cornea, the elevation map, looks quite normal to me. We're not seeing any warm or hot spots there. Going further, looking at the Bell and Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display, um, eliminating the three to four millimeters of the thin spot of the cornea, we're not really seeing any hot spots there. So this looks pretty good too. So the question is, why does this patient have this inferior steepening? And this is where OCT-based epithelial mapping has been very helpful for me. So if we pull up the epithelial map, you can see inferiorly, what we would expect to see is an area of epithelial thinning there, um, and, and maybe an epithelial thickness in, in the high 40s. Instead, what we see are warm colors, meaning that there's epithelial hyperplasia there, and the epithelial thickness there is, is around 60. So this doesn't, or this necessarily isn't consistent with someone that, that could have subclinical keratoconus. And instead, this patient in her left eye was a contact lens user, specifically a Torix off contact lens user, um, and she'd only been out of them for about a week. So what we did is we had her stay out of the contact lenses longer and that corneal topography did normalize and eventually she'd go she did go on to have uh, prk in both eyes and it's been a few years now and, and so far so good fingers crossed um, so this is um, a really nice example of, of not only does epithelial mapping help us weed out bad candidates but it could potentially um, eliminate false positives and find us candidates that we may have previously eliminated if we were just using anterior based um, corneal imaging. So I think at this point, uh, this is a nice natural time to pause and, and you know, Carver, let's see if there's any questions out there. Great. Uh, we have a few uh, quick questions. Um, the first is what method to use to screen for dry eye, given that you mentioned that back in the topography section, I believe. Yeah, so um, I briefly mentioned that using the topographer and looking for irregular miles, Myers, I'm sorry, is a nice way to screen for dry eye. But for me, the most important thing is the exam. I do a really thorough exam, um, and, and what I'm looking for are areas of corneal staining with fluorescein, areas of conjunctival staining with lysamine green. Um, I'm eliciting a, a, a very thorough history from the patient, making sure that they don't have dry eye symptoms. I don't use... Um, any other diagnostic testing per se, whether it's mm -hmm. MMP9 testing or, or tear osmolarity, but those are also uh, great tools as well. But it is very important to, to, to screen adequately for, for pre-existing dry eye. Great. Uh, and then I had a question asking, uh, going really into the theory of uh, kind of the best fit sphere versus the uh, best fit ellipsoid and uh, the representation of the eye. Um, do you, uh, is there a good reason to use a best fit sphere over a best fit ellipsoid? I will say that both options are available for representing the cornea on the pentacam. Right. I think there's multiple options on the pentacam. Um, 
the reason I like to use a best fit sphere is in my opinion, I think it is probably the easiest way or the clearest way to interpret and, and, and it makes the differences or, or elevation differences a little bit more readily apparent. And, and at least in my experience, that's what I'm most comfortable with. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, uh, how do you, or how long do you tend to wait after contact lens removal before you do uh, either topography, tomography, or uh, epithelial cell uh, mapping, or you know, your that's OCT? A, that's a great question. And you know, the, this is a little controversial. There's there have been some recent reports out there that all you need to wait are three days. Um, I. I not sold on that quite yet. So for me, it depends on the type of contact lenses. So as a rule of thumb, if a patient is a soft contact lens user, non-toric, I have them wait a week. If they are a toric soft contact lens user, I have them wait two weeks. Um, and if they are a rigid gas permeable lens user, then you know all bets are off. Um, that can really cause a lot of corneal warpage. And the rule of thumb there is one week for every decade, or I'm sorry, one month for every decade that they're in it. Um, and of course, if I screen them with my testing and I'm seeing things that don't make sense like that one case, then oftentimes what we'll do is we'll have them stay out of the lenses even longer because it can take longer than, than, than that one week for that corneal to normalize. Great. I think that's uh, a good amount of questions for now, but we'll have more time for questions at the end. So uh, everyone, please keep on sending them in. Perfect. Great. Thank you. All right, so we, we briefly talked a little bit about, you know, LASIK and PRK, and in my practice, I offer both, and I want to go over a little bit how I decide which one is better than the other for this particular patient. So my first goal is I want to, you know, definitely minimize the risk of a potential complication, and then goal number two is to make, you know, patient convenience and comfort a priority, uh, because, you know, patients definitely value that. I have some colleagues that just do PRK. I have some colleagues that just do LASIK. And in my opinion, if a patient is a good candidate for both, after having a thorough discussion about kind of the procedure itself and the different healing times, I leave it up to the patient. Um, and in my practice, at least, I'm doing about 75% LASIK, about 20% PRK, and about 5% other. And that other is either um, ICL surgery or a refractive lens exchange. Now, the first thing that I want to minimize is the risk of ectasia. So kind of this is my thought process when deciding between LASIK or PRK. So if, I, if on my diagnostic testing, I have a patient with subclinical keratoconus, well, then obviously I'm not going to offer um, either one right now. Um, things may change in the future with, with different cross-linking protocols, but at this point, I am not offering any sort of refractive surgery in anybody with subclinical keratoconus. But then there are those borderline cases. And what I mean by that are patients with regular corneas but thinner corneas or patients with high myopia that would necessitate um, deeper ablations and you know there have been numbers thrown out there about residual stromal bed you know some literature says you want to keep that residual stromal bed above 250 microns i like to use 300 so when i calculate and if the residual stromal bed is less than 300 microns i would lean towards prk or ico that has been a concept that's been around for a while. What's a little bit newer is this concept of percentage tissue ablated or percentage tissue altered is, is a better way to put it. And what this is, is a calculation um, of how much corneal tissue you are changing. And, and what you do is you take the calculated ablation depth and add that to the flap thickness and divide that by the total corneal thickness. And if this percentage tissue altered is greater than 40%, um, there is there are literature out there that suggests that this increases the risk of ectasia. And I tend to be on the conservative side during, during my evaluations. And if I do have a patient that has this PTA that's greater than 40%, um, I am pushing them towards PRK or even an ICL. And here's kind of a case that, that demonstrates that. So here is a 32-year-old female who has a fairly high amount of myopia, as well as um, a moderate amount of astigmatism. The axial maps on the topography are, are fairly regular. The, the irregularity in the right eye, that's actually a little bit of artifact that sometimes we do see in placido ring-based topography. Uh, here are, is the pentacam, the format refractive, as well as the bad display for the right eye. Um, and this is 
a very typical elevation that you would see in someone with um, a moderate amount of astigmatism. But most importantly, we're not seeing any hot spots or warm spots on either the anterior or posterior cornea. We've got a good corneal thickness. The left eye, again, the same thing. We've got regular with the rule of astigmatism, no hot spots of elevation, and a good corneal thickness. So when I did my calculations, um, if I were to perform LASIK on this patient, um, I typically make a flap of 110 microns using a femtosecond laser. So we've got pretty good reliability um, with that as far as getting the thickness that we want. I calculated that the residual stroma bed in the right eye would be 319 microns, and in the left eye would be 308. So according to my criteria for residual stroma bed, this patient um, would be okay for LASIK. And you know, I was happy to hear that because I do get wary of doing PRK on these high myopes because of the risk of haze. However, when I did my percentage tissue altered calculations, it came out that we would be altering 43% of the patient's right cornea and 45% uh, of the patient's left cornea. So that made me a little uncomfortable. So the question is, do we do LASIK? Do we do PRK or do we do something else? Um, and in this situation, I kind of eliminated LASIK because of that higher PTA value. And we had a discussion, either PRK with mitomyosin C, discussing the risk of haze or ICL surgery. Um, and for a variety of factors, um, cost being, being one of them, this patient decided to go with PRK. And again, we're a few years out and she's doing quite well with no signs of ectasia. And unfortunately she did not develop haze, um, at least up to this point. So this is a nice example of where I've changed my practice pattern a little bit, not just relying on residual stromal bed thickness, but also taking into account this percentage tissue altered. And, and that has been uh, quite helpful for me as far as risk stratification. Now, beyond um, ectasia risk, there are certain situations where I prefer LASIK over PRK and vice versa. So, you know, if I have a patient coming in saying that, you know, they need to be, you know, I do my surgeries on Thursday. If a patient is pushing, if they can go back to work on Friday, um, and they want to be up and at it right away, then perhaps PRK is, is not the best option for them, given that they want that quick recovery, and LASIK may be a better choice. Also, patients that are at higher risk for haze, um, keloid formers, for example, I do like to avoid PRK, and uh, I would perform LASIK with caution. As far as patients that I push more towards PRK, we talked about dry eye a little bit. Anyone with significant dry eye needs to be treated first, whether it's with um, lubricants or, or topical anti-inflammatories or, or the plethora of treatments available out there for dry eye. Um, definitely address that first. But even if there's some mild residual dry eye, um, there, there is the thought out there that LASIK can induce more dry eye than PRK. PRK still does that, um, but I often push those patients more towards PRK. Um, patients with a lifestyle that you know puts them at high risk for, for flap trauma, um, I definitely urge them to do PRK. I used to do a lot of refractive surgery uh, for the Army uh, a few years ago, and the vast majority, as you can imagine, of those patients received PRK. I think one of the most important things and often underlooked things is the existence of EBMD. And we'll see where this becomes apparent um, in, in just a few minutes, but um, in a patient with EBMD, that, that opens up the risk for um, multiple complications. The biggest one probably being during LASIK, um, the formation of an epithelial defect. And, and really we want to avoid any epi defects at the time of LASIK because that increases the risk of other complications which we'll talk about just in a minute. But also, if you have EBMD, other things can happen. For example, vertical gas breakthrough, where the gas um, emitted by the femto uh, second laser during flap creation, instead of creating um, a nice flap, escapes through an area of weakness or, or less resistance, which would be the EBMD, and you get vertical gas breakthrough, which then can, can pose a significant problem as far as lifting the flap goes. And oftentimes, these cases, uh, we go ahead and have to abort. Um, and then one other trick that, that I have started using is when patients fail the applination test, meaning when I go to check their pressure and, and you know, they're jumping out of their chair, jumping backwards from the slit lamp, those may not be the best LASIK candidates just because when the applination cone comes down and, and, and attaches onto their cornea and the suction is applied, we don't want these patients flinching or moving. And, and if they're not too keen on getting their pressure checked in the office, then perhaps, you know, avoiding flap creation and just doing PRK 
may be the more straightforward and safer option. So um, I check pressure on all of my um, refractive surgery evaluations myself, um, not because I'm obviously I want to know and make sure that their pressures are okay, but more importantly, how they react when on, when the pressures are actually being checked. So that's a, a nice little trick that that I've I've started using. Um, so what we're going to end on here are are some complications, and and we alluded to this a little bit earlier, and and there's two in particular that that I'd like to emphasize. So you know we have a busy referral practice at Wells Eye Hospital. We get patients from all over the Delaware Valley, all over the East Coast, all over you know the country, and and a lot of times you know as we mentioned earlier, complications from refractive surgery are are very uncommon. Um, but they do happen, and, and sometimes these do funnel in towards us. So this is a patient that had myopic LASIK um, in both eyes six weeks prior to coming to us and came in for a second opinion because of poor vision. And she told us that um, the, the night of surgery, um, she, she had a fair amount of pain, and she was told that her, at her post-op day one visit that she had an epithelial defect um, on the cornea and a bandaged contact lens was placed on the eye. When she presented to us six weeks later, she had an uncorrected vision of 2100 and a best corrected vision where I can only get her to 2080. And when you look at this image, this is a retro illumination image of the cornea, you can see um, a lot of fine striae, but one very, very prominent striae uh, nasally on the right side of your screen. And this striae was inducing quite a bit of irregular astigmatism. And then we've overlaid a topography here showing that there's quite a bit of, of steepening in that area. And you know, when looking at this topography, um, as you'd expect, the patient's vision was was not good. When looking at the pentacam, again, the axial map does show uh, that uh, steepening as well as flattening 180 degrees away, and the elevation map does show some subtle elevation in the area of that striae. Um, now, striae usually occur either because of uneven alignment at the end of the case or, or movement of the flap, and, and that's why not rubbing your eyes and avoiding trauma is of utmost importance. But other risk factors include epithelial defects, um, flap slip, slippage, thin flaps, and, and larger ablations. And the key really is detecting these striae early. And things to look out for on clinical, clinical exam Typically, if you have a superior hinge, these striae are typically or oriented vertically. And if you have a nasal hinge, they're oriented horizontally. And sometimes they can be hard to see, especially the subtle ones. Now, not so much the, the first picture that I showed you, but this image right here, this is a patient that presented with, with poor vision, again, several weeks after LASIK. And if you look at that direct illumination photo, you can't see anything, but against a dilated pupil using retroillumination, you can see these fine striae on the bottom right image there going right through the patient's visual axis. And this patient had, you know, an uncorrected and best corrected vision of about 2040 and was not happy with that result. So these are visually significant striae. Another trick um, that is helpful in detecting these striae is using fluorescein staining. So this is another picture. Top right, again, you can see the striae um, using retroillumination, but if you put fluorescein in the eye and use a cobalt blue filter, you can see negative staining in the area of striae. And then if you look at the flap edge, you can see pooling indicating that the flap is a little bit misaligned and, and the gutter there could be a little bit bigger. Other things that, that may suggest that the patient has striae would be an unintended hyperopic shift. Um, but, but what's really been helpful for me is looking through um, a dilated pupil using retroillumination and fluorescein staining. Uh, because again, early detection is key, and I apologize for that cheesy animation there, but it, it's meant to emphasize that if you have visually significant striae, they're not going to go away by themselves and they do need to be treated. And the longer you wait, the more difficult it becomes to treat. So for example, if you pick up on this very early and you see a striae going through the visual axis on post-op day one, oftentimes, you can stretch this at the slit lamp or, or in a minor room without having to lift up the flap. You can just take a dry cellulose sponge and kind of pull the flap um, on either side of the street and kind of stretch it out. And, and oftentimes that works and it's a pretty straightforward, fairly atraumatic way of doing so. If you pick it up fairly early, for example, post-op week one, um, you often do have to relift the flap, but really what you have to do in most cases is just relift the flap hydrate the flap, stretch it out, and put the flap back down. 
and that often takes care of it. However, if the presentation is more delayed, you know, three, four, five, six weeks later, what happens is the epithelium starts to remodel and almost acts like a tether. Um, and in order to get these striates to, to smooth out, you can't just lift the flap up and put it back down. But oftentimes what, what we have to do is remove the epithelium, lift up the flap, stretch the flap, put it back down, and then put it on stretch. And, and what that um, involves is usually placing um, several tight sutures to, to pull the flap and, and, and kind of flatten out those three. And that, that's a big surgery um, with a fairly long recovery period. And we do like to avoid that if possible. And there's always the option if, if the patient isn't interested in any more surgery, um, contact lenses like a scleral lens. But this patient population, remember, they paid a fairly significant amount of money to, to not wear contact lenses. So generally patients don't go for this option. So here's that patient um, that we had on the first screen and you can see that prominent stria. So we had to take her to the operating room and remove the epithelium. And, and one thing to point out is the epithelium came off very, very easily, um, much more easily than I'd expect in a young patient. So my thinking is, remember she had an epi defect on post op day one, she may have had some underlying EBMD. Um, and, and that's the reason why, why she had that epi defect. Now, this only being a few weeks out after surgery, the flap does come up fairly easily. And here, that, that stria was so large that she actually had some component of epithelial ingrowth there as well. So the epithelium kind of grew through that tented flap and, and grew onto to the stromal bed. So we're just using a 57 blade to go ahead and carefully remove that. And there's also some on the underside of the flap. So I'll go ahead and carefully remove that as well. Um, paying close attention not, not to damage the flap. Once all of that is off, we'll go ahead and put the flap back in place. And what I'll attempt to do here are use cellulose sponges and try to stretch out that stria. But again, those have been there for a while. So it just they just want to bounce back. So you know I try this for you know three, four minutes without much success. So at this point I decide to go ahead and suture the flap. Now suturing the flap can be can be tricky because you want to apply enough tension to put the stria on stretch, but you don't want to make the sutures too tight where you induce stria in the opposite direction. And this patient actually, because the stria were so prominent, I ended up essentially doing a corneal transplant like suture pattern there, um, putting sutures 360 degrees. And at the end of the case, that cornea looks quite regular. Now, what happens immediately after surgery is the patient's vision is, is quite poor. It's actually terrible um, because those sutures are so tight that we're inducing maybe some irregular stigmatism, some refractive error. Um, and, and these sutures, I can't take them out too quickly. So at about six weeks, I remove half the sutures, as you can see here. And then six weeks after, so about three months after the initial surgery, I, remo I remove the remaining sutures. And eventually, this patient went on to, to, to get to 20-30 uncorrected vision. Not perfect, but, but she was quite happy, and that was a result in topography. So, you know, the, the moral of the story here is, you know, because there was such a delayed presentation, she had to have this extensive surgery. But if it's picked up early, the fix can be, can be much more straightforward. The second kind of flap-related complication that, that I'd like to touch on is, is epithelial ingrowth. Um, and again, a risk factor for this is an epithelial defect. So again, we want to avoid epithelial defects at the time of LASIK. But other risk factors include repeat LASIK, so enhancements, um, and, and flap slippage, whether it's from eye rubbing or trauma. Now, these more commonly are asymptomatic. And clinically, they'll look like white, grayish opacities that are seen under the flap. Um, sometimes they look like a thin line of cells. Sometimes you have classic islands, as you can see um, in that top right, as well as the, the bottom right picture. Um, and sometimes if it's bad enough, these flaps can melt. And that's what's happening on the bottom right portion of the bottom right photo. That patient had a little bit of flat melt. Symptomatically, um, patients complain of poor vision, whether it's monocular diplopia, photosensitivity, usually by induced irregular astigmatism, as well sometimes these patients um, complain of foreign body sensation. And the decision to treat is based on how symptomatic these patients are. So 
Um, if I see, uh, I first monitor these patients to see if the, the ingrowth is progressing. If I see that it's marching towards the visual axis, that's a sign that I need to treat it. If the flap is melting, then certainly it needs to be treated. And again, if they're having complaints, whether it's decreased vision, poor quality vision, double vision, photophobia, or foreign body sensation, I do decide to treat. And then the question is, how do we treat these? So the flap has to be lifted and the epithelium has to be removed. And again, needs to be removed from both the stromal side of the flap as well as the underlying stromal bed. And then there are certain things that can be done to hopefully prevent the epithelial ingrowth from coming back, whether it's placing fibrin glue or hydrogel sealant along the flap edge, or again, suturing the flap back down. Oftentimes we use adjuvant uh, alcohol or mitomycin to either devitalize uh, the cells or, or prevent um, these from growing back. And then finally, um, we have found that YAG laser can at times be beneficial in these cases. So here's another surgical video. This is a patient of my partners, uh, Chris Rapuano at Wills, who had a fairly prominent island of epithelial ingrowth. She was quite symptomatic. Um, and, and we decided to surgically remove this. This flap is a little bit older, so it's, it's a little bit stickier. So care has to be taken um, as far as lifting it, just very gently teasing it off. Um, I like to avoid grasping the flap and, and crushing it um, because kind of the dimpling that can occur on the flap can kind of act as a conduit sometimes for a recurrence of the ingrowth. So um, try to avoid squeezing or crushing the flap. And then again, using a blade to remove both the ingrowth on the stromal bed, as well as a ring of epithelium um, outside of the flap edge. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we get pretty close to the limits and this becomes a little bloody, but it's in our experience important to remove um, that ring of epithelium beyond the flap edge. And this, uh, in our experience and in the literature, um, does reduce the risk of recurrence. And carefully using a blade to, to scrape away the epithelium on the undersurface of the flap. And then what we'll do is irrigate copiously just to make sure all particles are, are off and then float the flap back into position. Now notice the entire flap wasn't lifted, only enough to remove the ingrowth because we don't wanna create other potential avenues where the flap is otherwise healthy um, for epithelial ingrowth to grow back in. And just like the flap stria case, we'll go ahead and suture the flap back down. And again, the thought process of this is to tightly oppose the flap to the underlying stromal bed um, to hopefully prevent recurrence of the ingrowth. And again, these sutures, as far as removal, the timing, um, I do this very similar to striae, so half of them come out in about six weeks and the other half six weeks later. I wanna close with uh, just another interesting case. This is a patient that um, actually was referred in after having epithelial ingrowth removal attempted times two. So this patient's first surgery, uh, he had a flap lift, removal of the ingrowth, and then fiber and glue was placed on the flap edge to oppose the flap down to the underlying stroma to hopefully prevent recurrence. Unfortunately, the patient recurred, so they underwent a second surgery, this time with suturing of the flap back down, but as you can see here in the image that there is a recurrence of the ingrowth. Um, and you can see kind of the, the faint scars from the suture that was placed previously. And this patient had an uncorrected vision of 20-25, but was very unhappy with their subjective vision. So they had persistent glare, photophobia, and some foreign body sensation. If you look at the patient's topography, you can see steepening in that area of epithelial ingrowth, as well as on the pentacam, you can see um, elevation of the anterior cornea that corresponds to the area of ingrowth. So then the question is, what do you do here? Option number one is do nothing. That really wasn't an option for this patient. They, they were quite unhappy. Option number two is to try another repeat flap lift um, and, and resuture it. Now the patient, keep in mind, is 2025 uncorrected and, and we weren't too keen on lifting the flap up again. Um, or number three, maybe a less invasive option and that would be YAG laser treatment of the syngrowth. That's what we decided to do. So this is a fairly straightforward, non-invasive treatment for, for epi and growth that we've had good success with. And, and again, in the literature, um, there have been reports of good success with this as well. 
And uh, we set our YAG laser to a power of 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millijoules per shot, so very low power. And the goal is to create these cavitation bubbles within the area of ingrowth. And you can see those bubbles in that photograph there. So what I'll do is I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot a spot, and then I'll go just to the edge of the bubble that's created and shoot another spot. Now, what I want that bubble to do is expand and expand and expand until it's covering um, a good amount of, of the ingrowth island. And we do like to limit our shots to about 20 per session to decrease the risk of flat melt. So what this means is oftentimes we have to do multiple treatments and patients definitely need to know that. So patients come in every one to two weeks for multiple treatments. And, and often what we see is fibrosis and then eventually regression of this ingrowth and, and more normalizations of the patient's topography and elevation maps. Um, so this is a nice little trick, a non-invasive trick that um, we try perhaps before moving on to more invasive things like surgical removal and flap suturing. Um, so you know, that's the end of that case and then that's the end of the talk. So to summarize, um, at least in my hands, I favor uh, multiple methods of diagnostic testing when I'm doing my preoperative evaluation, um, especially when it comes to ectasia risk screening. Um, my theory or, or my practice is to balance um, minimizing complication risk with patient convenience when deciding between LASIK and PRK. And finally, complications following laser vision correction, again, are quite rare. It, it's a great surgery. It's a safe surgery. But it's important to recognize that they can happen. And when they do happen, it's important to recognize them promptly and treat them promptly if indicated. So at this point, I'd just like to, to open the floor to, to Carver again to see if there's any questions out there. I'd be happy to answer them. Awesome. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. We do have a number of questions waiting. And uh, if you've not yet asked uh, any questions you might want to answer, either directly related to the talk or directly related to refractive surgery uh, and, you know, complications or, um, you know, screening or anything like that, go ahead and put them in now. All right. Uh, so, Looking at the questions, we do have a number. Um, all right, so the first question. Uh, given we just talked about uh, the different uh, complications that might occur, you said that they are very rare. Um, and I know that a lot of people are kind of uh, afraid of that. And so do you know what percentage of patients either experience like stray or epithelial ingrowth? Um, the, the numbers vary depending on, on what you look at. What I quote patients is much less than 1%. Um, so it, it is it is low. I don't have an exact number. Um, it varies from practice to practice, report to report, but but it is in our experience, much less than 1%. Visually significant, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Very rare. All right. Um, so why, uh, what's the reasoning in terms of choosing, like lifting the flap and removing epithelial ingrowth uh, with a scalpel um, before using a YAG laser? Um, it depends on how extensive it is. So for example, the video that I showed, that was a pretty prominent, thick, beefy area of epithelial ingrowth. And that probably would not have, have gone away with the YAG laser, or if it's just all over the entire cornea, um, kind of like one of the images that I showed at the, the bottom right, that, that may not respond well. or if there's already flat melt there, that's probably not a great one to try to YAG because you could potentially induce flat melt. But you know, if, if it's mild, that that's a lot of times our first go-to because you know, like the the question was implying, it's it's not that invasive. It's generally quite safe, and and has um, a pretty good success rate. Now again, the the recurrence rate following YAG laser varies depending on the literature. Some reports say as low as one or zero percent in, in, in one report that I read, and, and some is as high as you know 20 or 30 percent. Um, but in, in our experience, it is it is a nice viable option. 
Now, if the patient's looking for something more definitive, again, it's up to the patient a lot of times. It's a conversation to be had. If they just want to get rid of it and give them the best shot of, of resolution and they're willing to take on a more invasive surgery, well, then perhaps that patient is better off with a flap lift. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned earlier on in the talk how kind of the three options that you present patients are LASIK, PRK, and uh, ICL. And you kind of talked about when you'd rather use uh, PRK over uh, LASIK or maybe when you'd rather use LASIK over PRK. Uh, when do you use uh, ICL? That's a great question. And, and uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't touch on this in the talk just for time constraints. But ICLs are, are very nice options in the appropriate candidate, meaning their anatomy um, is appropriate for an ICL, meaning their anterior chamber depth is big enough, their corneal endothelial cell count is, is, is nice and healthy. And patients that would be maybe better ICL candidates than LASIK or PRK candidates are those with corneas that are too thin, meaning if, if the residual stromal bed um, would be too low, even with PRK, that's a better ICL patient. Um, in patients that are very that have very high levels of myopia. So for example, the lasers that we have in the United States have certain limits. And depending on the laser, um, you know, it's, it's usually, you know, low teens. But if, if someone has, you know, 18 diopters of myopia, you can't treat that with a laser. And if you can, not, not that well. So those patients do, do very nicely and, and an ICL can be life-changing those patients. Another option is patients with kind of borderline iffy corneas. So let's say you have a patient with astigmatism, that maybe is a little irregular, suspicious, inferior steepening, maybe a little of abnormality on the, the elevation maps on the pentacam and maybe some epithelial changes. So maybe they have subclinical keratoconus. And ICL is a potential option there as well because we're not touching the cornea at all. You know, it, it's purely a lens-based procedure. We're not, aside from a, a few small incisions, that we're, we're mitigating the risk of potential ectasia. So anyone with an abnormal cornea who's not a great laser vision candidate, an ICL is, is a very nice option. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, you mentioned that you definitely want to treat dry eye before refractive surgery. What are kind of the difference in outcomes for those patients that, uh, whose dry eye symptoms just aren't noticed before uh, refractive surgery? Yeah, so if you have someone that has pre-existing dry eye um, and and you don't pick up on that and you treat well the 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 big danger and what we fear is exacerbating that dry eye and making it uncontrolled and you've now taken a patient that had let's call it subclinical dry eye with some corneal standing and no symptoms to a patient that now has symptoms and signs and is very unhappy with the way the eyes the way their eyes feel. So that that's definitely what we're trying to avoid. And that certainly can happen. And then there's been some you know, bad publicity in the media sometimes in patients that just complain of debilitating dry eye or pain um, after after laser refractive surgery. So we want to avoid situations like that and, and and careful screening is is certainly important. That being said, you know, there was um, a paper that was put up by the NIH um, or, or sponsored a study sponsored by the NIH, where my partner was a co-author, and they found that, you know, in certain situations, dry eye got worse after laser refractive surgery, but there are other situations where dry eye actually gets better after laser vision correction. And the thinking behind that is this subset of patients with contact lens-related dry eye. If you get them out of their contact lenses, they actually may feel better, and and that is motivation for a lot of patients that come in um, oh, for cool. laser vision correction. So it, it sometimes it takes some time and talking to the patient, asking them about the dry eye symptoms. Do you have the dry eye symptoms all the time? Or is it only after you've had your contact lenses in for several hours? And, and sometimes we can actually help um, some of their discomfort. That's uh, really good to know. Uh, I guess uh, it's probably just a little bit less obvious when things do get better. And it really right. took you know that study to bring that to light. Um, do you treat uh, dry eye yourself or do you pass it off to a specialist? Um, I'm a cornea specialist. Um, so, um, my practice not only is refractive, but it's cornea anterior segment. So, um, awesome. I have a, a pretty big dry eye practice. So, um, awesome. I, I treat it myself. Awesome. 
Um, what I have a question asking about a, a drop regimen after LASIK and PRK. Do you use a drop regimen? I do. Um, so my personal preference is a little bit different for LASIK compared to PRK. So let's start with LASIK. Well, both um, groups of patients get antibiotic drops afterwards for a week, usually four times a day for a week. Um, for PRK, I do put um, all PRK patients on a steroid drop. Um, I prefer to use kind of a, a, a lower potency steroid drop. That's not a great way to describe it, but maybe a steroid drop with less of a, a risk for steroid response. So I really like to use something like Flarex, for example, and I'll have them use it four times a day for two weeks and three times a day for two weeks, twice a day for two weeks, once a day for two weeks, then stop. There's a lot of different regimens out there. Actually, the FDA trials used fluoromethylone um, on a monthly taper. So four times a day for a month, three for a month, two for a month, one for a month, zero. That's a long taper to have patients um, do. They're not too happy about that, but that's what the FDA trials for PRK were conducted on. Um, so I kind of cut that in half. Um, but I do know of certain surgeons out there just do, for example, prednisolone acetate on a weekly taper for four weeks, but I prefer every two weeks. For LASIK, on the other hand, um, I, I'm less worried about inflammation, especially after the first week or so. So I'll use a steroid you know, every two hours for the first day or the day of surgery, and then starting post-op day one, four times a day for a week, then twice a day for a week, and then I usually stop. So it's a, it's a more abbreviated taper for LASIK. Perfect. Thank you so much. That is all the time we have for questions tonight. I just wanted to thank you, everyone who sent in questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Dr. Megpara, for such a wonderful presentation and a bunch of wonderful answers. Thank you, Carver and Oculus, for the invitation. And again, most importantly, thank you to everyone that joined us this evening. We really appreciate you uh, taking your time out of out of the day. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.